I had a period in middle school and early high school where I was really into the band Metallica. I was exclusively listening to their Pandora station, I would play their Guitar Hero game every day after school religiously, and I was learning how to play guitar by playing along to their songs. To say that I was obsessed would be a little bit of an understatement. When it was time for me to go to college, my love for the band kind of fell by the wayside. There hadn't been a new album in six years, I was getting into completely new genres, and I was listening to music that was absolutely new to me. By the time their 11th album came, out when I was like a sophomore or junior in college, I had no interest in it. But last month, Metallica dropped their 12th studio album called 72 Seasons. I thought it would be fun to revisit one of my old favorite bands and see what they were up to nowadays. Then I thought it would be fun to revisit all their albums to see if I still feel about them the same way that I did 15 years ago. Holy fuck, I feel old knowing I was consciously doing shit 15 years ago. Anyway, I want to take a look back at all 12 Metallica albums and their career as a whole. If you're thinking about getting into Metallica, then consider this as a good starting off point. This band has been around for 40 plus years, so there's 40 plus years of history and drama, but I'm not going to get into everything because that would make for an extremely long video series. But if there are any major shifts or huge events that I feel are completely unavoidable, I'll get into them. If you're really into Metallica, feel free to fill in any of the gaps that I might have left out in the comments below. Alright, let's get started. Metallica was started in 1981 after rhythm guitarist slash lead vocalist James Hetfield responded to a newspaper ad made by drummer Lars Ulrich. In the ad, Lars stated that he was looking for metal musicians to play Iron Maiden, Diamond Head, and Tigers of Pantang covers. Soon, they were joined by bassist Ron McGovney and lead guitarist Dave Mustaine. The four would go on to record the No Life to Leather demo, which was hugely popular. The group, which initially formed in LA, found a lot of support in San Francisco, so they decided to haul ass up there. After a bunch of successful demos were put out in April 1983, the band started recording their first album, Kill 'Em All, in New York. Shortly after arriving, Dave Mustaine was kicked out of the band because of his drug and alcohol abuse, as well as his violent outbursts. Later that day, he was replaced by guitarist Kirk Hammett. Dave became incredibly salty and decided that he was going to start his own band, and it was going to be so much fucking cooler than Metallica. The songs are going to be faster and better, and it's going to be a cooler band with a cooler name. Yeah, what's a cooler name than Metallica? Megadeth. But let's drop the A so it looks cooler. Also, side note, I've been thinking about doing a Megadeth retrospective, so if you'd be into that, let me know in the comments. So, in April 1983, the first official iteration of Metallica was cemented. Lars Ulrich on drums, Cliff Burton on bass, Kirk Hammett on lead, and James Hetfield on rhythm guitar and vocals. Fun fact. The original title for this album was Metal Up Your Ass, and this was the album art. The label didn't think it would be a good idea to call an album that, and they were probably right, so the project was renamed to Kill 'Em All. The album opens up with Hit The Lights, which honestly feels like the best intro the band could have. It's loud, it's fast, it wakes you the fuck up. The song is a statement as to who Metallica is as a band. They're gonna kick your ass, they have the energy to never stop, and you really get that from this opener. This song, and really this whole album, is all about speed and energy. The riffs in this song keep you moving through it at a breakneck pace, and the solos expertly lead you from one part of the song to the next. The instrumental break before the last solo provides a much needed break. There's a lot of energy, we're moving really fast, so this instrumental break before the last solo gives us a little bit of a breather before we dive right back into it. The solo kicks the momentum right back up and leads us through the rest of the song. Following that, we go right into The Four Horsemen. The song starts a little slower and a little funkier than the previous, showing us that this band isn't just about speed. The first riff in the song is so simple, but it just hits so hard. 
in the chorus the guitars are hitting these big chords while the bass and drums are driving the beat along. I feel that Lars and James felt that Cliff genuinely had something to add when it came to his bass lines, and he genuinely does. The song clocks in at 7 minutes and 13 seconds, but it doesn't feel like it does. The song goes different places, introducing different ideas, and somehow it all fits together. For example, at around the 3 minute 30 second mark where most songs would be wrapping up, this song goes into a much slower interlude. It highlights a bass line for a little bit before plunging into a solo that brings us back into the song's main riff and final verse after about a minute. We go into the final verse, we go into the final chorus, and there's another solo in here. Honestly, the way this song is structured and how it brings in new ideas and reinterprets old ones makes this 7 minute cut fly right by. Next up is Motor Breath, which is the shortest Metallica song ever written. Fast, punchy riffs, melt your face solos, if you're liking this album so far, you'll probably like this one too. Since I don't have much to say about this song, I might as well talk about something I've been thinking about while listening to this album. James' voice is genuinely insane. There's a fine line between shouting and screaming while singing and just actual shouting and screaming. James is as close as possible to crossing that line without actually going over it. The amount of control it takes not to go over that line is crazy. In my opinion, James's performance on this album is one of the best ones when being compared to Metallica's contemporaries. <laughs> Up next is Jump in the Fire. Every metal band needs at least one song about hell and Satan, so might as well do it here. I don't know if I'm tired, but here is where I got a little fatigued by this album. Sure, the riffs and solos are great, but again, it's just more of the same. Somehow, the last two songs felt longer than the Four Horsemen, despite both of them coming in at 3 minutes and 7 seconds and 4 minutes and 41 seconds, respectively. Bass solo, take one. And now it feels like Metallica was reading my mind 40 years in the future. Anesthesia Pulling Teeth is up now. The song is really interesting because of a couple of things. This is the first purely instrumental track that Metallica has ever put on an album, and it's not what you'd expect. Instead of having the whole band play or having the guitarist noodle around for a bit, it's mainly just Cliff doing his thing. Yeah, the bassist got a song all to himself. The last minute 45 seconds sees Lars jumping in on drums, but it's mainly just Cliff. Throughout the whole thing, we hear a noisy, distorted bass solo, and it's genuinely a birth of fresh air. The album knew that we needed a little bit of a break, and it gave it right to us. After a noisy, feedback-filled outro without warning, we dive into the sixth song on the album, Whiplash. The guitars and drums hit, and they hit hard. The drums drive along the simple tom pattern as we're introduced to the main riff of the song. Most of the riffs in the song really emphasize the phrase, keep it simple stupid. Thankfully the song switches up in the last minute and a half to a little more complex riff and another face melting solo. There's a couple songs that I often forget are on this album, and Phantom Lord is one of them. Honestly, there's nothing wrong with it, it's fine as a song, just pretty forgettable on an album with more iconic cuts. There is a neat little change up where the guitars lose their distortion, trading in for clean tone, and it's a nice section, but it's in and out before you even know it. No Remorse is another song that I also forget exists. Compared to the front half of the album, the back half feels a lot less memorable. It feels like this album is very much front-loaded. That or its primacy bias. The six and a half minute song chugs along, bringing in new ideas when it needs to in order to prevent fatigue, and it does so well. Again, the song is fine. I'm writing this as I listen to it, and holy shit, there's still two minutes left of the song. I feel like this is the first time I might be getting tired of a song on the album. But a new idea is introduced, the pace picks back up and pulls us through the rest of the song, making the last two minutes fly by. Holy shit, 
Banger Alert. Seek and Destroy is the ninth song on this album and it goes fucking horde. Another seven minute song that speeds by. Plenty of different riffs to chew on, fantastic solos. If there were party songs on this album, Hit the Lights and Seek and Destroy are definitely them. This is a song about just going around and fucking shit up. The bass during the chorus is nothing but fantastic. The energy is kept light and fun in this cut. The instrumental break halfway through the song, immaculate. The solo, beautiful. Overall, the song is just chef's kiss. Metal Militia is the final song on this album and another song that I honestly forget exists. But it did its best to remind me. It comes out of the gate swinging with energy in case you forgot this album's thesis. Just raw speed, aggression, and fun. I don't have much to say about this song, so I might as well talk about something else that I wanted to bring up, but I didn't know where. I know that when listening to metal, lyrics may not be everyone's focus. But the lyrics here feel like, I don't know, placeholders? I don't know if anyone else feels the same, but have you ever heard a song and the lyrics and composition feel perfectly crafted for each other? Like, my heart will go on. The words and the music fit so well together that one can't be changed without fundamentally affecting the other. I don't feel that way about most of this album. The only thing that feels like that is the chorus on Seek and Destroy. Everything else feels like it could be changed around and mixed up, but nothing would change. And for me, that counts against the song. The lyrics on this album mostly feel like an afterthought. Like, we need something for James to sing so people can sing along while listening. Someone just draft something. Got it? Okay, cool, those are the finalized lyrics. Overall, this album for me is a solid C+. You might be thinking, whoa, C+, that's kind of bad. But to me, a D is passing, and this album definitely passes. So many memorable riffs, fun solos, and the energy it brings is infectious. There's a lot of creativity behind these songs, and I can only imagine what it did to people in 1983. It holds up okay, and it definitely fills a niche for me. After the success of Kill 'Em All in February 1984, Metallica hit the studio in Copenhagen to record their follow-up, Ride the Lightning, which was released in July of the same year. If Kill 'Em All's opening record, Hit the Lights, had an antithesis, it would definitely be the opener for Ride the Lightning. Instead of coming in hard, fast, and loud, Fight Fire with Fire comes in with these slow acoustic guitars accompanied by a harpsichord. I'm not sure where I heard this, but I think Cliff was big into classical music, so it might have been his call to have this intro. Then, out of nowhere, it builds and hits to that familiar, hard, fast, and loud we were introduced to in Kill 'Em All. But something's different. Fight Fire with Fire feels heavier. It's still blazingly fast, but chugging harder and bassier than the entirety of their last album. This whole album has a much darker feel than the previous venture. Even James' voice sounds more sinister on this cut. Lyrically, the song is definitely a step above anything on Kill 'Em All. The song talks about mutually assured destruction, something that was on everyone's mind in the mid-80s. Remember the Cold War? I sure as hell don't. While it isn't that deep, at least there's some kind of substance in the writing where Kill 'Em All mainly thought of lyrics as just a way to deliver a different melody. Up next, we have the album's title track. I have a theory that specific songs for different artists truly mark them coming into their own as musicians. ADHD by Kendrick Lamar is the first real Kendrick song. Dance Dance is the first real Fall Out Boy song. It's an artist's step away from general conventions within their genre in order to make a statement about who they are. I think you could argue that Metallica has two different points where they came into their own. The first time I believe that they came into their own is on this song, Ride the Lightning. The harmonizing guitars in the intro, the sliding power chords in the verse and chorus riffs, James's intense vocals all come together on this song to make a statement to say that we're Metallica. This is who we are as a band. Funnily enough, this is one of the first songs they wrote, seeing as how former guitarist Dave Mustaine has a writing credit on it. Honestly, I'm glad that this didn't make it onto Kill 'Em All because it would have stuck out like a sore thumb. This six and a half minute cut breezes by thanks to the different directions that are taken in this song. No idea stays long enough to become stale, but all are expertly woven together in a way that makes sense.
Following Ride the Lightning is For Whom the Bell Tolls. This is arguably the second point where Metallica comes into their own as artists. Relatively slower than the previous songs, it opens up with these big loud chords on the guitars with the drums playing along in unison. Cliff has some time in the spotlight as he plays the song's iconic melodic bass introduction. Honestly, this shit sounds incredible. It's haunting, really. An earworm that gets stuck in your head long after you've heard it. We get a simple lead guitar interlude that brings us into our first verse at around 2 minutes into this 5 minute long song. The massive chords keep playing throughout the verse simulating the bells that toll for whom. The lyrics draw heavily from Hemingway's 1940 novel of the same name. The song discusses the horror and atrocities of war. So far we've had a song about nuclear fallout, the death penalty, and casualties of war. I wonder what it would have been like if Metallica continued down this path of politically aware music. They could have been the 80s version of Rage Against the Machine or System of a Down. In fact, we kind of did get a sonic equivalent of Metallica slash System of a Down, but that won't be for another 21 years. Back to the song. It's a heavy cut. The simple drum beat keeps the march moving along and James's vocals actually hold the spotlight during the verse and chorus given the simplicity of the riffs that dominate the song. The song has a minute long outro that keeps the theme of simplicity. It repeats a pattern of three different chords as a lead guitar wails in the background. The guitar genuinely sounds like falling bombs and planes flying overhead, keeping the theme of war present in the listener's mind. Next is Fade to Black. It opens with a somber acoustic line as the lead guitar that's minimally distorted just plays a solo over top. The solo sounds like it's lonely and full of despair, like it's wailing out for something and waiting for an answer that never comes. The lyrics cover the topic of suicide. Apparently the lyrics were written by James after the band's equipment was stolen out of their van in Boston. And honestly that's just another reason to say fuck Boston. The verses are mostly played on an acoustic guitar which is another bold move and you have James actually singing instead of doing his half shout, half sing, half bark vocal style. The chorus hits us with big distorted guitars in case you forgot what band this was. But again we return to acoustic guitars and barely distorted leads as we come back to the verse. The song takes a lot of risks for a heavy metal band. Emotionally vulnerable lyrics, slow acoustic guitars, weepy melodies, you would think we were listening to Dashboard Confessional for most of it. I'm missing you the final verse sees the distorted guitars come back in full force. The song then goes on a two minute tear full of harmonized guitar melodies and a solo that doesn't necessarily shred as hard as anything that came before it. Restraint is the name of this song. Not only can the musicians in the band flex and show off how fast and hard they could play, but they also know when and how to dial it back. <laughs> Trapped Under Ice is the fifth song on the album. It brings us back to the idea of Metallica that we're familiar with. Fast riffs, shreddy solos, barking vocals, all of it. The song kind of feels like a callback to Kill Em All in a way. It's definitely not the same, but this song and the songs on the previous album feel like they share the same DNA. If this song were mixed and produced differently, I definitely could see it on Kill Em All. Lyrically, the song doesn't stand out. Not a lot to say about it, if you're enjoying the album so far, you'll probably like this song too. There are very few albums out there that don't have any tracks that are skips. Honestly, I can't name any right now. For me, Escape is definitely a skip. And I know I'm not the only one that feels that way. I mean, the song's genius annotation even says that this is James's most hated song because the record company forced them to write something more radio friendly. They didn't play it live until 2012, 28 years after the album came out. And that was the last time they played it live. This is easily the weakest song on this and the last album. You could tell even in the outro that James is just over the song by that point. Not a controversial take at all, but honestly this song just kinda sucks. All around it feels really phoned in. Thankfully, Creeping Death is next. This one's for all you Old Testament heads out there. No, not the old people who are fans of the band Testament, but like, Judeo-Christian Old Testament. Lyrically, the song is about the book of Exodus, specifically the Angel of Death, and it fucking rips. 
The riffs go hard, the vocals are on point, the drums are going crazy, the solos beat your ass, structure of the song is just beautiful. The song feels so tight despite it being six and a half minutes long. I keep bringing up how long these songs are because I think it's important to highlight how it doesn't feel like these songs are actually that long. As soon as an idea is about to start becoming stale, it changes up into something new. Very few musicians have the talent of knowing how to properly pace a song. Sometimes songs can be 3 minutes but feel like 10, which is bad, and 10 minute songs can feel like 3, which is truly fantastic. You get sucked into a song, you want to see where it goes next, you feel every twist and turn the song takes. Think of it like a movie. If you're going to watch a 3 hour long movie, you don't want it to feel like 3 hours. I'm looking at you, Avatar. Last up we have The Call of Cthulhu, a 9 minute long instrumental. The song really lends well to its namesake. It starts out very eerie but curious. There's something scary around but you can't help but want to know more about it. The longer the song goes on, the more it opens up and the more sinister it becomes. Kind of like you're stumbling onto something you shouldn't know about. My favorite part about the song has to be the random shit Cliff is doing behind the riffs. Can you tell I'm a bass player? You really have to listen for it to truly appreciate it. At first it just sounds like random noises, but when you start digging in you can really get a broader picture of what's going on. It feels like it's playing into the theme a little bit too. There's something sinister happening and you have to be on the lookout for it in order to see what's really going on. Despite being almost 10 minutes long, this song never gets boring. Ideas are introduced and reintroduced all over the place. Reinterpretations keep older ideas from overstaying their welcome. New breath is constantly being breathed into the song. Overall, I'd give Ride the Lightning a solid B+. It's a bold new direction for the band carving their way into their own niche. The band is really coming into themselves as artists and they're trying to figure out what to do with this whole Metallica thing. This album could have easily been an A if it wasn't for Escape kinda killing the momentum in the middle of the record. When people think of Metallica, they typically think of one of three records. 1986's Master of Puppets is the first one of those three, and for good reason. To say that this album launched Metallica's career would be an understatement. Master of Puppets catapulted Metallica to new heights that most artists could only dream of. Spoilers, but this album is really fantastic. I could listen to it day in and day out and still find new things about it. The first song, Battery, starts off with a classical guitar intro. Layers and layers of guitars pile on top of each other until we get hit with massive chords and lead guitars that pick up the melody. Right off the bat, the production of this album is heavier than Ride the Lightning. We move into the song's main riff, a triplet chug broken up by sharp power chords. In the first verse, we hear James is singing more clearly than ever. The energy that each musician brings into their part is infectious. Everyone is firing on all cylinders in this cut. About halfway through the song, we get a little break from the pace. But as soon as we get used to it, the song kicks back up into another fast riff with Kirk just shredding over it. I want to point out how good the production on this track and really this whole album is. Everything sounds clear and distinct. After the solo, Lars goes into this double kick pattern and each hit is so clear and defined. This album stands head and shoulders above anything the band has done before and we're only one song in. The title track is up next. If I could pick one song to keep in Metallica's repertoire and throw the rest out, it would be Master of Puppets. Everything about the song feels expertly crafted. The hard hitting opening chords, the main riff, the bass line grooving under everything, the transitions between every part of the song, the jaggedness of the verse riff, it all feels perfectly placed. The verse slash pre-chorus riff is something to be in awe of. It lulls you into a false sense of security, then, out of nowhere, the time signature shifts from an easy to understand 4-4 four, four to uh... Is this right? 21 over 32? How the fuck do you even count that? It literally throws the listener off their feet. Like they were speeding along and then somebody hit the brakes. It sounds awkward, but that goes with the feel of the song. It makes you feel like you're not in control, which is perfect considering the lyrical content of the song. This specific track is about addiction. 
The speaker in the song isn't the addict, but it's the thing the addict struggles with. Whether it's drugs or alcohol or something else, the lyrics intentionally feel vague. The chorus alternates between a 4-4 and a 2-4 time signature. This shift doesn't throw off the listener as much as the verses do, but the shift is still felt. I'm not a music theorist because I'm not a nerd, but I think the shift is more stable than the others because it still has the quarter note counting the beat. Don't quote me on that, I pulled that out of my ass, but it feels right. This moment of respite sees all the instruments playing as melodically as possible. The harmonized guitars in this section sound somber, but hopeful. We're transitioned back into the distortion as the guitars keep the same melody they were playing in the clean section. We then go into a march feeling riff. The perspective shifts from the drug of choice to the addict as James yells, Buster, 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 Truly a point of victory for the subject in the song. We launch into the track's main solo and as soon as it's over, two new ideas are introduced into the song. We're six minutes in and we're still being brought new concepts. The song returns to its final verse and chorus as we wrap things up. Truly a tour de force. If you haven't listened to the song before, do yourself a favor and listen to it now. Next up is The Thing That Should Not Be, another song about Cthulhu. Instead of an E standard tuning, the guitars are tuned down to D standard, allowing for lower notes to be accessed. This plays into the thought of something troublesome lurking below the surface. Am I reading too much into that? Probably. They probably just thought it sounded cooler. This is probably the simplest song on this album, which is much needed after the seemingly never-ending maze of Master of Puppets. A straightforward track that serves its purpose in the album and does so well. Like all things when making an album, I think that this song was purposefully placed after Master. The first two songs, even though they had breaks built into them, were still super intense. This serves as a little pit stop in the album. And that's not a bad thing. If this album was top to bottom shredding and complexity, it would have been really hard to listen and sit through. Not necessarily a banger, but a much appreciated rest that we get three songs into the album. Welcome Home Sanitarium is truly a sleeper. The song opens up with clean guitars and they stay for a bit. The effects on the guitars in the song actually sound really good. If you're into different effects then you'll probably be into this song. The front half of this cut is just kinda there. Not really good, definitely not bad. The back half is where the song really kicks it into high gear. If there's a way to just have the second half of the song, I'd really take it. As soon as life gets brought into this track, everything feels so much more natural. The song starts off a little slow, but the back half really saves it. This is the kind of song that rewards someone for sticking around to listen to the whole thing because the last couple of minutes truly make the first part worth sitting through. Aw shit, if you fell asleep during the last song, Disposable Heroes is here to wake you back up. Another song about the horrors of war, Disposable Heroes is the exact kind of song we need right now in the album. Fast, punchy, and heavy. Again, the whole band is firing on all cylinders. This whole song is pretty straightforward. The riffs are simple and serve their purpose well. Between the verse and chorus, we get this lead lick from Kirk with this truly unique tone. The song is definitely a cut that was meant to be performed live due to its tons of opportunities for crowd participation. In a way, it's almost like a rallying cry for a bunch of soldiers in an army. Overall, a fun song that brings back the energy this album needed after the last two cuts. Leper Messiah is the sixth track on the album. This song looks at the corruption found in organized religions. I'm probably sounding like a broken record when I say this, but this song is just great. The riff keeps the listener invested, the vocal performance is great, the drums keep everything moving along. This is one of the shorter cuts on this album, but it sure is memorable. The album's instrumental track, Orion, is up next. You know, Cliff hasn't been making too many waves on this album so far. Part of me feels like he was just saving it all for this one song. The song starts off with distorted bass chords leading us into the song's main riff, and once that idea is established, we go into a solo. But not a guitar solo, a bass solo. We come back to the main riff for a guitar solo and go into a much slower melodic clean section led by Cliff's bass. The bass is truly the centerpiece of this song. Every other part feels like it was built around it. Melodies, harmonies, and counter melodies are all playing around with each other during this portion of the song. 
It's truly beautiful. We put on a little distortion as the guitars and bass play in unison underneath a guitar solo. After that, the two guitars keep playing the same line as the bass launches into its own solo. The song goes back into its heavily distorted section once again as we are taken into another guitar solo and then brought back to the song's main riff. A fantastic instrumental that takes a listener on an adventure. Last up is Damage Incorporated. The song is absolutely vicious. The guitars are going all out and Lars is hitting his drums as fast and as hard as he can. The verse riff in the song is truly one of the fastest the band has ever written. James is giving it all in his vocal performance. The song is going as hard as it can and it really doesn't stop for anything. This is the only way to end an album like Master of Puppets. Raw speed, energy, and big heavy hits to round us out. Master of Puppets really is Metallica's magnum opus. This album turned the band into metal legends and that's not without merit. The album itself is really well put together and sounds amazing. All the songs feel unique but they all sound like they belong together. Every cut on this album serves a purpose and they flawlessly take you from one idea to the next. Easily an A plus album for me. Everything is amazing when you're on top of the world. After the success of their latest LP, Master of Puppets, Metallica cemented their place as metal legends. They were top dogs. Nobody could touch Metallica. Everything was perfect as their careers were launched into the stratosphere with no sign of it ever coming down. Everything was perfect. Every metalhead on every continent loved Metallica. Every band in the world wanted to be Metallica. They were on top. But there's something funny about being on top. When you're on top, you feel like you're invincible. And when you're invincible, that's when you're most vulnerable. While on the Damage Incorporated tour in support of the Master of Puppets album, tragedy struck the band. On their tour bus, the band was complaining that their bunks were pretty uncomfortable. When it came to choose a bed, they drew cards. Cliff drew the ace of spades, so he got first pick. He turned to Kirk and said, I want your bunk. That single decision changed the whole trajectory of the band. Shortly after 7am on September 27th, 1986, the bus skidded off the road. Because there were no restraints on the bunk, Cliff was thrown out of the window of the bus, which then landed on top of it. He was killed instantly. In no doubt, this event rattled the band. They were untouchable just a few hours ago. Now, they were reminded that they were mortal men after all. Without time to truly understand what happened, the band buried their heads on what lay ahead of them. The show had to go on. First order of business, finding a new bassist. Almost immediately, Metallica started looking for their new fourth horseman. Three weeks after Cliff's funeral, auditions were held. After trying out a bunch of different bassists from all over the country, it was the last person they auditioned that would end up joining the band. That bassist was Jason Newsted from Flotsam and Jetsam. According to Jason, he was kept last because he and Lars had known each other for a bit. The drummer asked the bassist to come in last despite him being the first to get there. Jason was asked to finish out the Damage Incorporated tour. After a six month hazing period, he was asked to formally join the band. In January 1988, the band would go on to record their fourth studio album. Blackened is that song. It starts with the guitars and bass playing backwards and it builds up a lot of anticipation. Then, it happens. The anticipation is released and the song officially starts with a hard hitting riff. I might as well comment on it now, but the guitar tones on this album are insane. I'm not sure what frequencies they were dialing in, but I would kill to have another album with guitars that sounded as sharp as the ones on this album. The guitars and drums are booming on this cut. But you know what isn't? Come on, you've listened to the album before and you just wanted some guy on the internet to confirm what everyone else has said. There's no bass on this album. And that's true. You see, Lars and James mix and Justice for All. And what happens when someone in the band mixes an album? I'll let Jason tell you. Any record we listen to, doesn't matter if it's Red Fang or whoever. Yep, yeah, yeah, yeah. Rutan, I was coming in. Okay. Gee, who mixed that record? 
The guitar player. <laughs> okay, who yeah. mixed that record? Well, considering that the hi hat is louder than the lead vocal, I'm going to say the drummer. <laughs> Let's get back into it. Everything about this intro just screams raw aggression. Even more aggressive than Master of Puppets. Metallica is getting heavier and heavier with each album. The verse riff on this song is all about keeping a groove, whereas the chorus riff aims to hit us with massive chords. The flow between these two sections is quite nice. They feel like opposite sides of the same coin. The main riff in this song just absolutely rips. Honestly, I'm running out of ways to say how good something is in this retrospective. If I sound like a broken record, I'm sorry, it's just that these first four albums are so solid. After the second chorus, we go into an ascending riff, and with this tone, it sounds incredible. This brings us into an extended bridge, which is a nice change of pace. We go into a section with so many layered guitars that I imagine the tracks looking like one of those sandwiches from Scooby-Doo. We go into Kirk's first solo on the album, and it's just amazing. The second and third parts of the solo are truly creative. Honestly, my favorite part about the song is when Kirk is getting out of his solo and he just hits this. It makes me feel like I'm powering up every single time, just like... It's great. It's fantastic. I love it. We go into our last verse and chorus and we make it out of this blistering 6 minute and 42 second song, only to be greeted by... The song starts out pretty calm with clean guitars, but just when you think you're safe, BAM! Bring out the 15 layers of guitars and the giant ass drums. The intro alternates between the clean and distorted guitars until the distortion wins out. A minute into the song, we get the rug pulled out from under us. Everything stops, then picks up, then stops, then picks up. This descending line feels like it's tumbling down a flight of stairs and all you can do is try to hold on. We're introduced to the song's main riff, a simple two chord line with single notes thrown in for flavor. The song's lyrics cover the hypocrisy of the criminal justice system, specifically looking at how money could pretty much buy you out of getting in trouble. Very much a straightforward concept, but what sells it is James's vocal performance. So much anger, so much seething, you can really feel it in his delivery. My favorite part of the song has to be the guitar line in the middle and at the end of the pre-chorus. It just sounds so fucking cool and I can't explain it. It just slaps. Hard. After our second chorus, the rug is pulled out once again as we go into an iconic solo performed by Kirk. It isn't the most complicated solo in the beginning, but it picks up near the end. The solo serves the song really well in my opinion. After that we return to distorted guitars picking up the intro melody. Every time it repeats, new layers are added on, making it sound like an entire orchestra of guitars are playing right in your ears. Heading back into the final section of the song, it makes me wonder why people weren't all too into it when it first came out. The song wasn't played much live after the And Justice For All tour because according to Kirk, he couldn't stand people yawning at the 8 or 9 minute mark. But this song flows really well. It's a fun ride with new ideas being brought in and out. Really fun song. Eye of the Beholder is the third song on the album, and it's pretty decent. The riff in the intro is pretty simple, but heavy. After everything fades in and we move past the intro, we go into another riff that sees the guitars harmonizing, and it serves as a transition into our first verse. There's a weird filter effect over James' voice, and I have to say I'm not really the biggest fan. Thankfully, this idea doesn't stay long as we go into the pre-chorus and chorus of the song, still keeping it really simple throughout the song rather than going for fast and complex. Unfortunately, the filter on the voice is back for the second verse. I genuinely think the song would have been better without this effect. Sure, it gives the track a little more identity, but it does so by taking it down a level. The main riff is given a little more complexity as we move to our transition to the song's middle break. Kirk's solo in the song isn't the most technical he's played here, and before I get comments about this, no, I can't write a better solo, nor do I ever plan on writing a guitar solo, but it gets the job done. Last verse, same as the last two. The last chorus wraps us up, and we go into the next song. One is up next, and it's truly one of Metallica's most iconic songs. Believe it or not, this song was pretty controversial for fans a year after the album came out, and in my opinion, it was for the dumbest reason ever. As you can see, I'm not using footage for the band performing this song, I'm using the music video. And that's why it was so controversial. Because they put out a music video. You see, making a music video is seen as selling out, and real artists and musicians don't need to stoop to promoting a song with a music video. To think that Metallica was selling out with this song is truly a brain dead take. Wait till the people who thought this was selling out see what the band does in the 90s. This song centers around a World War I soldier who stepped on a landmine but survived. The soldier was left without his arms, legs, and face. 
The video uses clips from the 1971 movie Johnny Got His Gun along with scenes of the band performing. This song takes the same approach as Fade to Black did. Clean intro with a solo, clean verses, heavy chorus with a bombastic outro. Kirk solo on this song is something to be in awe of. It's ridiculous how good it is. I can't really say much about this track except it's one of those songs that you really need to listen to to fully appreciate. Following one is The Shortest Straw, Lars's favorite song that he's never once struggled to play. Going along with the sonic theme of this album, the song trades speed for weight in its intro. The verse then goes into this double time feeling riff and that feel stays throughout the whole song. We get a lot of interesting sounds coming out of Kirk's guitar during his solos. There really isn't much to say about this song. It comes in, does its thing, and gets out. This might be the album's lowest point. It isn't bad or anything, just a little lull in the album. Harvester of Sorrow is probably the most stripped back song on this album. It doesn't have nearly as many guitars as the songs that came before it. Like The Shortest Straw, the song serves its purpose on the album. But it's around here in the album that I became a little fatigued. Sure, the riffs, solos, and vocals are great, but now is where the less iconic songs on the album kind of blend together. This is a me thing, like everything else in these videos, but I'm not sure if I could accurately name the songs certain riffs are from. The album doesn't have much variety. I know earlier I said that I wish more guitars sounded like this, but I didn't mean I needed a whole album of just this tone. It's like a double-edged sword. I love how this sounds, but I need other sounds to appreciate it more. Freight Ends of Sanity is the seventh song on the album and it starts off pretty strong. I love the vocal intro the song has. As the verses and choruses hit, I have the same feeling that I had on the last two songs. It feels like deja vu listening to this album at this point. Don't get me wrong, I don't think any of these songs are bad by any means whatsoever. They've been really good. They build off each other really well. Remember what I said when I was talking about Master of Puppets? about all the songs sounding different but sounding like they belong together. This album feels like it's been one long song because there really isn't much of an identity outside of a couple standout tracks. Take this song for example. This really cool thing that Kirk does to introduce his solo sounds really sick. Listen to it here. I have heard stories, specifically from Jason in this interview, that the album was being mixed and mastered while Metallica was in the middle of a really intense tour. They would play a couple shows, Kirk and Jason would go to the next stop while Lars and James flew to the studio to work on the album. I read that the two really couldn't hear what was happening on the album because all of the loudness they were surrounded by on a daily basis. I realize I haven't been talking about Freight Ends of Sanity much in this section because I don't really have much to say about it. I think the end of the course is really cool when the instruments and the vocals all line up and play in unison. Other than that, not much to say about this song. It's just fine. I wouldn't be offended if it came on. I might skip it. I might not. It really depends on my mood in the moment. To Live Is To Die is And Justice For All's mostly instrumental track. I say mostly instrumental because it has a couple of lines written by a 1600s German poet and Cliff spoken near the tail end. The song serves as a tribute to Cliff. It's the last song that he worked on chronologically before he died. You could tell that Cliff worked on this song immediately as classical guitars fade in to introduce the track. Then, almost like a train coming from a distance, the guitars and drums fade in and take over. We're introduced to the song's main riff and transition line which repeats before we move on to a lead lick that just sits over top of the idea. A new riff is brought in and we get another line to play over top of it. We go into the song's first solo and it's pretty solid. It doesn't really sound like anything that's been on this album before. Each part is unique and refreshing. We get long sustained chords as other guitars come in to harmonize with each other right before we move into the song's clean section. This is what the album was missing, something to change up the pace and it helps that the bass is very much present in this section. Here we actually get a solo performed by James. It's crazy how you can just tell who in the band is playing between the two guitarists. James's solos are nowhere near as shreddy and feel like they have a lot more emotion behind them. As soon as I heard it, I was like 90% sure it wasn't Kirk and I wasn't surprised at all when I looked it up to confirm it. The distortion comes back as we transition out of the quieter midsection. Just as the song feels like it's going to wrap up, we're brought back to the song's main riff as James performs the spoken word portion. The song recapitulates 
the riffs and ideas we've been introduced to before it fades back into the classical guitars we heard back in the beginning, bringing the song full circle. This would be the last instrumental that Metallica would put on an album until 2008. This was honestly a great way to end the trend. It's a strong track that brings in the best parts of a Metallica instrumental. Is it my favorite of the four they've put out so far? No, that's probably Orion then Call of Cthulhu, but third place isn't bad when you're going up against two behemoths like those. I'm going to get backlash in the comments for that, I could feel it. Dyer's Eve is a banger. That's all I could say about it. Okay, no, but really, this song goes hard. Much like how Damage Incorporated was the only way to end Master of Puppets, Dyer's Eve is the only way to end Injustice for All. The song brings tons of energy, everyone's performing as hard as they can. This is probably one of my favorite songs off the album. To be in the same category as Blackened and Justice for All and One is no easy feat. You can tell that they wanted to wrap this album up in the prettiest bow that they could. Dyer's Eve is that bow. They knew they had to bring it and it was brought. To me, and let me emphasize that, to me, and Justice for All is a step down from Master of Puppets. Is it a big step down? Not at all. Master of Puppets was an A plus for me. You can't go higher than an A plus. This album is a solid A minus. Still an A, but not an A plus. I think the thing that really held this album back was sonically everything just blended together. Metallica is usually really good at bringing in new ideas to keep things moving along, but I really didn't get that from this album. The three songs after one feel like they drag on. We get a much needed change of pace on To Live Is To Die, but it feels like it came a little too late. If the instrumental was placed a track or two earlier, it would have been a lot better for me. After And Justice For All, it seemed like there was no stopping the Metallica train. They kept getting bigger and bigger and pushing harder and harder. It all felt like it was going to some place no other band had ever reached. They were nearing the top of their mountain, climbing higher than any band before them ever had. It was a perfect storm leading up to 1991 when they released their fifth studio album. I said a while back ago that there are three albums most people think of when they hear the name Metallica. The first is Master of Puppets, the second was And Justice For All, this is the third. The album starts off with Metallica's biggest hit, Enter Sandman. A clean guitar introduces us to the song's main riff and we slowly build on it. Sonically, it's nowhere near as dense as anything on Justice or as complex as Master. The song is something that anyone could easily jam to. Here is where the band kind of takes a detour away from the heaviness and complexity they were known for. A lot of fans felt like the band was selling out at this point, trading their style for money. But I don't really feel that way. At least not yet, anyway. Enter Sandman is a song that could only be written by Metallica. I cannot picture any other band making a song like this. It's the perfect mix of being heavy enough and catchy enough that it catches a wider audience. People who are really into distorted guitars and people who aren't into metal can enjoy this song together. Great opener, great vibe overall. Sabatru is here to tell the audience that just because Metallica made a more radio-friendly song, they still haven't forgotten how to write a heavy hitter. The main riff on the song is really groovy. It kind of reminds me of the descending line that I liked off of End Justice For All. The verse riff is pretty simple, serving its purpose to support James's lyrics about a darker side of a person taking over. It could be read as another song about addiction, but it could be any negative part of a person completely engulfing them. I feel like the song goes on a verse too long, but that really isn't much of an issue when looking at the track's relatively short runtime of five and a half minutes. Next up is Holier Than Thou, which harkens back to the band's thrashier roots. A triplet intro riff leads us into just an excellent verse and chorus riff. There's something different with this song. James's voice sounds a lot cleaner than it did on previous albums, but it's not his clean singing voice. For those out of the loop, while recording a cover, James blew out his voice so he had to get a vocal coach in order to get him back up to speed. Although the shouty, barky attributes of his voice are missed, he's still able to perform on this album pretty well. Holier Than Thou is a fine song, all things considered. It shows up, does its thing, then heads out before it overstates its welcome. A super short Metallica song that knows what it is and what it needs to be to be a really fun track overall. It's time for another ballad. 
The Unforgiving opens with an acoustic guitar and a clean guitar playing over top of it. Instead of sticking to the clean versus heavy choruses formula that they were used to, the band decided to change it up this time around. As we move out of the intro into the first verse, the distortion hits and this time the chorus is clean. So they took what they've been doing and just hit it with the Uno reverse card. A nice change of pace in the album. The solo on this album is really great. Not super shreddy, but really cathartic. Kirk and producer Bob Rock butt heads a lot during the recording of the solo as seen on the documentary A Year and a Half in the Life of Metallica. Overall, solid song, standout track from this album. Wherever I May Roam feels a little tacky by today's standards. It starts off with this Eastern inspired intro and riff and I wish there was a little more creativity behind it. It wouldn't be too bad if it wasn't the song's main hook so we hear it a lot in the almost 7 minute runtime. The production choices during the verse are actually really good though. We get these heavy guitars backed up by acoustic lines. The bass line in the song is really good too. After Justice, I really miss hearing that lower end. And it's a shame because after scripting and recording the Justice portion, I found remasters of the album that boosted the bass a bit and the parts sound really good. It was sorely missed and Jason's parts were really solid. They're just as solid here. The tone they're getting on the bass is thick and warm which really rounds out the sound of this album. Again, can you tell I'm a bassist? Even though the main hook sounds kinda corny to me, the rest of the song is pretty solid. So far we're 5 of 5 on this album. Don't Tread On Me is the sixth song on the album and I don't really remember it that well. We open with a simple riff that goes into a fun groove when the drums come in. The verse takes the intro riff and gives it some motion by moving it up the scale. I really don't have much to say about the song, really. It gets a little stale after a while. The riffs in this song all build on the same idea but don't have much variation so the song kind of just blends together. There really isn't much of an identity for all of its different parts. Overall, just kind of meh. Through the Never kicks the energy back up with a faster paced riff than the last song. This song is just fun. The main riff pushes forward throughout the song and halts on a dime. The verse riff is simple but driving. There are these lines in the guitars that break up the straight staccato notes for a little flavor. The vocal effect on James's voice from Eye of the Beholder are back but they sound better and are used very sparingly, only showing up as a way to transition from the verse to the chorus. I think this is the perfect way to use that effect and it sounds great here. The breakdown in the song is really good. The vocals pan from ear to ear and it sounds fantastic. Great sounding song with a fun hook. Two ballads on one album? Nothing Else Matters is the 8th song on this LP and it's easily one of my favorites. Everything about the song is super vulnerable. The intro of the song feels like it hands off each part so gently. James is singing as gently as he can and it really fits the track well. The song subtly builds on itself the longer it goes on. We get these soft spoken strings in the background that are present throughout most of the track. The song knows that it shouldn't overcomplicate itself and it does so well. The song builds up to a solo that releases all of this pent up energy. It isn't flashy or anything but it's exactly what the song needed. The song is beautiful. It's one of those songs that you need to listen to to fully appreciate. Okay with all that sappy shit out of the way it's time to get back to the heavy stuff. A Wolf and Man comes out swinging, and I love what it does with the staccato chords that Kirk is playing. This song is about a werewolf transforming into a monster, but in my mind I like to think it's the band's way of coming out as furries. If this isn't played at every furry convention, then I'd be really disappointed. The song is fun and lighthearted. You can tell that the band just wanted to write a fun song to jam on for a bit. We also get some howling in the song, and that pretty much seals that fun idea for me. Not a serious song, but just something to keep things fun and light. I'm waiting for some fans to make an AMV for this song and Jacob from Twilight. This song goes hard as hell. The bass intro slaps and we get the guitars coming in to complement the idea. They all play in unison as we go into the first verse. The song feels like a big thick hug for your ear holes. This track is really heavy sonically and lyrically. James wrote this song about his parents' religious beliefs and how that influenced his mother's loss and her battle with cancer. Because the family was Christian scientists, they believed that all ailments could be healed through prayer. The lyric healing hand held back by the deepened nail I think is one of Metallica's strongest lines. Really a great song. 
I think Jason was pissed no one heard his bass parts on Justice because the last song in My Friend of Misery both start off with really exposed bass parts. This is another song that I forgot exists because it kind of just blends in with the rest of the album. To me this song is pretty average, and average for Metallica is not bad at all. Apparently this song was originally an instrumental but James just laid vocals on top of it. It would have been interesting to hear how different this song could have been if it was just an instrumental. I mean, it has all the hallmarks of an instrumental. Driving bass lines, heavy made riffs, stripped back clean section, harmonized solos, so it doesn't really surprise me that that was the original intention for the song. Solid song, but not a standout for me. Struggle Within is the last song on the album and it starts off with a marching snare beat that gives way to the song's main riff. Again, the song is fine just average. By the time the solo was over, I was ready for the song to be done. Not a lot to say about this song, really. This album was pretty fun to go back and listen to. I hadn't listened to it top to bottom in a really long time and it was genuinely good. My main complaints with it are that the last couple of songs kinda dragged on a little too long for my liking. But overall, the album presented new ideas when it needed to, every song had its own identity, and there were some genuine bangers on the album. This is easily another A- for me. They did it. Metallica successfully became not only the biggest heavy metal band, but the biggest band in the world. The Black Album served them well. It charted for 488 weeks on the Billboard 200, only outlasted by Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon and Carol King's Tapestry. With widespread critical and fan acclaim, there was only one thing the band could do. Coast for a bit, then completely change up their sound. It's no secret that the Black Album sounded a lot more commercial than the band's previous outings. The tracks on the LP were much more accessible to a broader audience. Hardcore fans felt a little betrayed by the band because they saw this as selling out. People are often changing their sound as they grow as people and artists and this is the direction that Metallica want to go at the time. I don't think they sacrificed their identity or their art to hit mainstream success with their self-titled album. I just think it was coincidental that it eventually became one of the biggest albums of all time when they decided to soften their sound. So no, I don't think Metallica sold out with the Black Album. I do, however, feel like they did sell out with their next album, Load, which was released in 1996. Leading up to Load, the band completely changed their image. They cut their hair, they changed their style, they even changed their logo. Okay, this is a new move for the band, but we still haven't heard any of the music. Maybe it'll be good. Sure, it won't be another lightning master or justice, but the Black Album was good, so it could be good too. Maybe just different. And different isn't bad. It's just different. And... Okay. I feel like I'm just putting off listening to this album. Full transparency, Load is an album that I'm not really familiar with. I don't think I've ever listened to it top to bottom. I tried listening to it a couple of weeks ago when I first had the idea to do this retrospective and I couldn't get past the opener. But I'm willing to give it another shot. Okay, let's just get into it. Since this is the first track off the album, it's our first impression of the band's new sound. But I want to talk about an earlier impression I had, and that's the artwork. You see, when I was younger, I thought the artwork was lava. That's because I only had a low resolution image of it on my iPod or PSP or whatever the hell I was listening to music on back then. Turns out I was wrong. Apparently the artwork is a photographic study done by Andres Serrano. This image was created by mixing bovine blood and the artist's own semen. Appropriately, the photograph is called Semen and Blood 3. I'll leave you with that as we listen to the first song titled, Ain't My Bitch, which is just, Okay, okay. I'll try to keep an open mind with it despite this horrible title. The song starts off strong. The intro isn't too bad, we get a driving drum line, and the guitars are also pushing the pace. Then, right before the verse, we get Kirk playing a lead line, and I'm sorry, it just kinda sounds like Home Depot core. The verse comes in, and it's not the strongest writing I've heard from James, but it's okay, I guess. And then we get to the chorus. And now it's time to kiss your ass goodbye. I'm sorry, bud. This all feels a little tryhard. This sounds like what every millennial or zoomer would describe as boomer music. I feel like I'm back working at Guitar Center and I'm tuning out the music they play and it just sounds like generic hard rock. We're only one minute into this song. The second verse is even worse than the first writing-wise. It feels like we're talking to a kid that learned that damn is a word that he could get away with around his parents so he's just using it all the damn time. And the solo just feels like it meanders. Like Kirk is just figuring out what key the song is in and just fretting notes that he's unsure of will fit. Overall, the song is just super generic boomer music.
Up next is 2x4 and we're officially further than my last attempt to listen to this album. Again, I'm really unfamiliar with most of the songs on this album so we'll take it as a first listen. Off the bat, it feels like another try hard tough guy song. It definitely feels super bluesy but it doesn't feel as slick as it should be to pull off the style. The chorus just, I can't really point to just one thing but it feels like death by a thousand paper cuts. The weird backing vocals that feel like they're mixed too loud, the weak lines that James is singing, the lack of character in the riffs, the awkward talk to 2 by 4 line is just insanely cringy. I wasn't cognizant in the year 1996, but was that a thing people said? Like I know about talk to the hand, but talk to 2 by 4 The solo here feels super stock in my opinion. There's nothing here that gives a song any character. Okay, the first thing I thought of when I heard the opening to The House That Jack Built was Tool. I'm probably alone in thinking that, but I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I like a lot of Tool stuff. The intro is pretty okay in my opinion, it lays a solid foundation. You see what I did there? Foundation, house, get it? Alright. The transition into the verse is pretty solid too. The verse feels drunk, and again, that's not a bad thing. Given the content of the lyrics and the idea behind the song, I think it's a really good fit. Some of the production choices, especially in the background, feel super distracting though. It seems like Metallica saw what grunge bands were doing earlier in the decade and wanted to do the same. I don't really know why it would fit other bands and not Metallica, but someone should look into that. The chorus lyrics feel very first drafty. Weak rhymes, weak imagery. The last chorus sees James giving it all on his vocals and it feels really awkward here. I can't really explain it. It felt like I wanted to give the song more credit in the beginning, but the longer it went on, the more I feel like it was dragging. I kind of remember Until It Sleeps, so it has that going for it. The fact that I could remember it at least 10 years after hearing it bodes well for it. I love the bass tone in the intro, super unique. That being paired with the shimmery guitars makes the duo sound really good. The pacing of the song is really solid, quick verses, choruses that pick up the energy post chorus that hits us then calms us back down into the verses. It goes into some pretty interesting places before the bridge, but it feels like a natural place for the song to end up as it brings us back to the chorus pretty well. This is probably the most solid song on the album so far. This is genuinely the first song on this album that I wouldn't mind revisiting. We get a smooth transition into King Nothing. Feedback and guitars and a solid bass line bring us in. This song also feels pretty bluesy, but I feel like it works better than 2x4. As soon as the verse hits, I'm immediately taken out of it. Wish I may, wish I might. Listen, I know James isn't the strongest lyricist, but this just isn't it. I know he can write lyrics that are much better than that. I know because I've seen him do it, literally on the last album. Sure, Healing Hand held back by the deepened nail isn't Shakespearean or anything, but it's definitely stronger than Wish I May, Wish I might. The song is okay, I guess. Honestly, the weakest part of it has to be the lyrics. Instrumental isn't too bad, but I wish more ideas were introduced into it. And to make matters worse, it ends with James singing Off to Never Never Land to remind us of a better song that the band made. Remember Ender Sandman? We made that. Please like this song. Please clap. Hero of the Day is another song that I remember listening to. I don't remember it, but I definitely remember listening to it. The song feels like a country ballad at the start, but some energy gets injected into the song. It kind of alternates between two ideas. The chorus, however, goes into a real hard rock feel. Honestly, it doesn't really work. It feels like the song has one too many ideas. I would have stuck to the alternated country higher energy feel. The harder section with the double kick drum feels like it's a little too much for this song. It would have been great if the song held back on some ideas. It really had some potential. Bleeding Me starts off really slow, almost like a lullaby. This song feels like it really drags on though. It takes forever to get to the first chorus at around 3 minutes in. Don't get me wrong, I don't hate long songs, but I need to feel like the song is going somewhere. This song feels like it meanders through the first two verses, hits the chorus, meanders a little more, and then goes back to the chorus. The track could have ended after the second chorus, but it goes into another section and extends the song for another 3 minutes. There's no reason for this track to be 8 minutes long. It seems super excessive. I think Metallica would have benefited from a fifth member in the band to serve as an editor and really question if all these different parts are necessary. Overly long, bloated song. Fun fact, Cherry has never been played live and it's the first Metallica song with slap bass. Do with that what you will. The song's intro feels really try-hardy. 
The spoken words layered under James's singing rubs me the wrong way. It feels awkward. Honestly, it's here that I feel like I'm giving up on this album. We're about halfway through and there's only one song that I feel like I've really enjoyed and it feels like a distant memory at this point. And it was only four songs ago. We still have another six to go. It's a bad sign when I'm actively counting how many more songs are left on an album. It's even worse when I'm looking at the time remaining in the song. Right now I'm doing both. Okay, I'm gonna be really honest right now. I've listened to every album so far in one sitting and they've all been fun. I feel like I need a break from this album. I'm gonna go to bed, try again tomorrow, and see how I feel about the rest of the album then. For me, it'll be like eight hours, but for you, it'll literally be two seconds. Okay, I'm back. I'm freshened up and ready to tackle this album again. Poor Twisted Me starts off as another country-ish jam and it builds on that idea in the verses. Again, this feels like another tough guy cosplay which is pretty disappointing. I don't have much to say about the song so I might as well talk about something else here. James's voice. It sounds better, like he's actually learned how to sing. Unfortunately, it also sounds like he's voice acting as every other try-hard rocker in their 30s. It doesn't sound like he's being his own vocalist on this album so far. In fact, everyone feels like they're doing impressions of hard rockers in their 30s. It really isn't what I'm looking for when I'm listening to a band that was constantly pushing the envelope not 10 years ago. It feels pretty generic and phoned in from them on this album. Wasting Hate tried going back to the band's harder roots, but the vocals on top of the instrumental feel very awkward. Even the lyrics feel really weird. Good day, how do? How do I what, James? I can't explain it, but the vocals and the rest of the instruments feel like they're going at their own paces and nothing really lines up. Wait, we're at the end of the song and there wasn't a solo? Let me listen to it again to make sure. Yeah, there isn't a solo on this song. The closest thing we get is a little instrumental break before the third verse. Honestly, good. The song does not need to be bloated up by a solo. Good restraint from the band. Mama Said is a country ballad dedicated to James's late mother. It really leads into the country vibes on the choruses. If Metallica wanted to go the country route, then I say let them. But this feels like an imitation of country music. It's like Metallica heard a bunch of country songs, heard some of the tropes in them, and took it. They didn't even make it their own, just took it. This is gonna be a little harsh, but it feels the same way as that one Avenged Sevenfold song feels. Kinda generic and fake. Everything about this song feels artificial. I'm not gonna say that the lyrics are artificial because I believe that's how James was feeling at the time of writing them, but the vocal performance sounds like everyone's impression of what they think country sounds like. There's a lot of country influence on this album, but none of it feels genuine. Mama Said feels like another disingenuous country rip. <laughs> The intro to Thorn Within feels like more tough guy posturing, but it leads into this quieter, cleaner verse with shimmery guitars that are broken up by a distorted guitar. You go back to the song's main riff for the chorus, but this feels lazy. The solo here is just another one that meanders and doesn't really go anywhere. Honestly, blink and you'll miss it. The outro feels like it goes on way too long, but we finally make it to the end. This is another song I can't picture myself listening to. <laughs> Ronnie is the second to last song on this album. We're almost there. The intro really overstays its welcome because it doesn't bring in anything interesting. The lyrics and the vocals don't really bring in anything interesting either. You can find thousands of songs like it and it's nothing I'd revisit anytime soon. Final song on the album. We've made it to the promised land. And this song starts off pretty promising. Really dissonant chords bring us into the song and leads us into a pretty good riff. The distorted guitars fall away and we're left with the drums and bass leading us into the first verse. The layered vocals here feel super eerie. I'm not sure if I'm a fan of it or I'm longing for something with character, but the production choices on the first vocals delivers. The chorus is actually pretty generic, but thankfully it doesn't stay long. I was worried about the song being almost 10 minutes long, but it doesn't feel like it so far. There's actual parts that feel unique and bring in new ideas. After the first bridge, we get an instrumental break with this really understated guitar line. Then it goes into a really wailey, screaming guitar solo, which is something that is sorely missed on this album. The song has character and this album needed it. The track still feels a little bloated and believe it or not, this is the cut down version. We fade out and we put the song and album past us. I hate this album. Sorry to be blunt, but this was the hardest album to get through thus far. Not because it was difficult or complicated to listen to, but because it was just so 
bad. If you like this album, more power to you. You're stronger than I am. The LP's long runtime does not help it at all. Apparently the Outlaw Torn was supposed to be 30 seconds longer, but the label said that the album couldn't go past 78 minutes and 59 seconds. Honestly, bless the label, but why such an arbitrary stopping point? Why couldn't the record company say you only have an hour max on this album? Did Ain't My Bitch have to be on this album? Did Cure? Did Wasting My Hate? Genuinely. I remember maybe two songs on this album and I just listened to it. Until It Sleeps and Outlaw Torn are standouts for me, but the rest of the album just feels like super generic dad fake tough guy rock. If I had to grade this album, it's probably a D-. It would have been an F if it didn't literally have two songs that were somewhat solid. Thankfully, I never have to listen to this album again. I'm sure the band learned a lot from this album, it'll take some time, and the next album will be nothing like it. What the f- Okay, so the original plan was to have Load and Reload be a double album. Funnily enough, I was going to make Load and Reload one video, but I decided against it after listening to the former album. The band felt like it would be too much material to digest as a double album, and they were right. Load was 80 minutes long and Reload is 76. Having a double album being 156 minutes long would have been a terrible idea. Load by itself was super hard to digest for me, but let's leave Load behind us. We move on. I'm guessing that it's going to be more of the same as the last album, but looking at the tracklist, I think I remember more more songs off of this album. It still isn't many, but I definitely remember listening to some of these songs. But let's talk about the album art again. The artist, again, was Andres Serrano. When I was younger, I thought it was some dyed water with some kind of solute to make a tornado in a bottle. I was wrong. Again. This time around, it's more bovine blood and... Serrano's urine. Appropriately, the photo is called Blood and Urine 26. Maybe I don't get it because I haven't experienced blood and urine 1 through 25. Truly deranged behavior out of this man. Okay, enough pushing this album off. Let's get into it. Give me fuel, give me fire, give me that which I desire. Ooh. Right off the bat, Reload starts off a lot stronger than Load. Fuel goes hard. Don't get me wrong, it's a dumb song, but it's a fun kind of dumb. When I hear this song, I can't help but think of NASCAR. And I'm writing doing so because NBC used the demo for this song as a NASCAR theme for a couple years. The main riff of this song is really solid. The bass thumping along also sounds great. The chorus and verse feel unique and they feel like they fit together. There's a funky halftime break that leads us into the solo and so far it's my favorite Kirk solo from this era. This is the energy I wanted out of Load. It's definitely a softer sound than anything on the Black Album or anything that came before it, but it still feels uniquely Metallica. It has character, it's fun, and it's genuinely a good song. The album is starting off really strong. Martin, babe, mirror, babe, gone insane, but the Like Fuel, The Memory Remains is another song I remember. I don't remember it as well though. I remember the intro and the vocal da da da's throughout the song. So let's give this song a listen. The track's main riff sounds really groovy. I honestly really like it. I don't appreciate the weird voice that James is doing on the verses though. It isn't terrible, but I think it would have sounded better in his normal singing voice. After the second chorus, we get a guest vocalist, Marianne Faithful, singing a simple melody. It's really unique and it feels like it comes out of nowhere. This may be nostalgia talking, but I think it fits really well in the song. It kind of gives a haunting feel to it. Another really strong song to lead off this album. Okay, I remember nothing about Devil's Dance. But it starts out with a really hard hitting bass line, so it has that going for it. I like the intro to this song. It's super dissonant and it has this uneasiness to it that sounds great. As soon as the first verse hits though, I'm immediately taken out of it. I'm not sure why, but James' singing on this track rubs me the wrong way. It sounds corny to me. The solo in the song feels really lazy too. It's just a trill over two notes and some bent chords. Then it gets interrupted by the chorus as soon as it starts to get interesting. The song started off really strong, but it's plagued by some confusing choices that were made while structuring and performing it. I remember listening to The Unforgiven 2, but I don't remember anything about it. Honestly, I think I only remember there's an Unforgiven 2 because I know for a fact there's an Unforgiven 3. The Unforgiven 2, The Unforgivener, is a country ballad. I'm not writing it off immediately. 
though. I know I wasn't the biggest fan of the country influence on the last album, but I'm willing to give it another shot. But again, it feels like country cosplay. I could say that the chorus is good, but it's literally the first Unforgiven, but half of the lyrics are different. It feels like the band is trying to get into the listener's good graces by reminding them that they wrote a really good song before. The solo in the track just sounds super stock. There's none of the anticipation or release that was present with the first song solo. What's crazy is that Bob Rock produced both albums. He was really pushing the band, especially Kirk, to get some stellar performances out of them. Where was he here? In the bathroom? Called in sick? Grabbing a latte? This song is a huge step down from the first Unforgiven, and it sucks that I have to delineate between these two songs now. The song, overall, isn't the worst thing I've heard from the band, but it's far from the best. It's better than most of the stuff on Low, but not as strong as most of the songs that came before it on the album. Better Than You is the fifth song off of Reload, and we're back to the try-hard tough guy cosplay that was all over the last album. Lyrically, the song is really weak. The more I listen to it, the more it sounds like a fake song. Like the one in every late 90s, early 2000s teen movie where the producers couldn't get the rights for the main character's band to play a recognizable cover at the end of the movie, so they had to play an original. Like if you lay this song over any one of those scenes, it would fit perfectly. Look, I'll do it right now. A filler song to pad out this album's runtime. Wait, hold on. Apparently, the song won a Grammy in 1999 for Best Metal Performance. Let's see who else was nominated. Okay, so it beat Nashville Pussy, which, yeah, the Academy was never going to recognize a band with that name. Rage Against the Machine's No Shelter, which is super critical of how American media controls the masses, so that was too risky to win. Ramstein's Du Haas, which sounds like this. and Judas Priest's bullet train that has this in it. Tell me Better Than You has performed better than any of those songs. I'll wait. Also, why was it nominated two years after the album came out? If you're gonna do that, pick Fuel. It's literally right there. Next up is Slither. The main riffs here aren't too bad, but again, as soon as James gets into the verse and chorus, I'm immediately taken out of it. The vocal layering in the chorus sounds super awkward. Again, the lyrics are super weak. Another song that feels like filler. The worst part is that it feels like it just keeps going and won't end. The song is only 5 minutes long, too. Please, just end. First off, horrible name for a song. Second off, this song isn't good. The song has a lyric, it don't feel good until it hurts, which isn't true. The song is hurting me and it doesn't feel good at all. Come squeeze and suck the day, come carpy DM baby? What the fuck does that mean? I'm genuinely confused. The verses sound like the band were trying to write a verse for Kanye's two words seven years early. Again, another filler song. I'm sure you're getting sick of hearing this phrase because I'm sick of saying it. Another tough guy anthem. It's super weak. I don't have much to say about this song. It's the shortest song on the album, but so far it feels like the longest. Did this song have to be on the album? This LP is already long enough, but we needed to extend it another 4 minutes so Bad Seed just had to make the cut. I remember really liking Where the Wild Things Are when I was like 13 years old. Let's see if I still have the same opinion. The riff sounds pretty alright, but the vocals really drag the song down. The layered vocals sound super whiny. Honestly, I'm not sure why there are so many layered vocal tracks over the last two albums. Sometimes they sound okay. Like when they're providing harmony, it sounds good. But when it's James singing in a different voice, it sounds super awkward. We get both on this song. During the verses and choruses, it sounds awkward, but during the line, Toy Soldiers Off to War, it sounds fine. I'm struggling to find a point in this song. It has this imagery of toys and hand puppets engaging in a war, but at the same time, the speaker sounds like he's prepping a child to go to war. Unless the children are the toys and they're being sent off to war? I don't know. I didn't study English enough to catch this metaphor. Someone please explain it to me. This song isn't all bad. 
I guess 13 year old me was kind of dumb and had shit taste in music, like every other 13 year old. There's something off about the intro in this song. The hits on the hi-hat don't sound like they line up with the guitar. Am I going crazy? Please tell me someone else hears that. Here, I'll play it. The hi-hats feel a little early, right? For some reason, Lars thought it'd be a good idea to play on the upbeats there. Why? I don't know, but it feels super off. As soon as the lyrics kick in, I immediately remember this song. It's another stinker. The song is about all the awful things that plague society like kids taking drugs, businessmen ruining the economy, and warmongers among other things. To say this track is biting off more than it could chew is understating it a little bit. Like these lines come back to back. The marks inside your arms spell me, spell only me. I'm the nothing face that plants the bomb and strolls away. Going from self-harm to planting explosives can't be done gracefully at all. Along with that, the instrumentation doesn't really do anything interesting either. The song is overall super unfocused and boring. Low Man's lyric is another country song, but this feels different. It's actually... good? James's performance really sells it here, and the lyrics are actually stronger than anything on the last two albums. You really get the feeling that the song is trying to admit. The speaker of the song is a man at his lowest. He feels like he doesn't have too many options other than ending his own life and is begging for forgiveness. Really, a heartbreaking song. Good song, probably one of the strongest out of the last two albums. Attitude shifts up the vibe and brings us back with some energy. It starts off really strong, then we get to the chorus and it gets super corny. I don't get it, as soon as this album shows some promise, it gets tossed out of the window. This album is actively trying to kill its own momentum. The song has too many parts for its own good. Lyrically, too many ideas are presented and revisited and it feels super awkward. The song is only 5 minutes, but it feels like 7. Fixer is the last song on the album. It starts off super interesting. We get some eerie sounding guitars to introduce us to the song and the riff it brings in actually sounds really good. The verse licks and vocal melody are pretty solid too. The song's subject matter is pretty heavy. It's about trying to heal what the speaker's father did to them. As soon as they get over it, another thing happens to reopen that wound. The solo on the song is pretty good too. However, I feel like the jam post solo could have been cut out or at least cut down. Another strong song on this album. Okay, I can't talk about my thoughts on this album without talking about Low 2. I think that this album is definitely the stronger of the two. Do I think it's a great album? No. But I do think there's potential for one solid album out of these two mediocre at best albums. Load and Reload could have benefited from a lot of editing. If we could go back in time and take all the filler out of both albums, I genuinely believe that we could have gotten a good album to reinvent Metallica's image with. If I had to come up with a track list for that fictional album, it would probably look like this. Also, change the album art. I don't want to look at Andre's piss or cum ever again. Rating-wise, I'd give this album a D. Better than Load, but barely passing. Even though Reload was the last original studio album the band had in the 20th century, it wasn't the last project they'd released in the 1990s. 1998 saw the release of Garage Inc., a covers album. It's actually a really good one too. It covers a broad range of rock music and has recordings going all the way back to 1984. I recommend checking it out if you haven't already. The last project they put out in the 1990s was SNM. This is a two-day concert where Metallica performed alongside the San Francisco Symphony, and this is really good too. It's mainly songs that have already been released, but there's a couple of new songs thrown in there as well. Heavy metal music and symphonic music shouldn't really blend as well as it does on SNM. It's totally worth a listen. New music was slow to come out leading up to and going into the new millennium, and that's for a couple of reasons. The first reason is because Jason kind of did something. I'll let Lars explain it to you. He fucking left the band! He fucking left the band! Which part of that is... Hello? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? He fucking left the band! I mean, period! Exclamation point! <laughs> so yeah, Jason left the band after being with them for 15 years. A while later, Jason explained that his decision to leave did not come easy. He wanted to focus on his band Echo Brain, and James did not like that Jason was splitting his time. 
On top of that, Jason stated that he felt like the business behind Metallica did not really care for him or the band in general. They only cared about the money the band generated. After that happened, James, who has been struggling with his addiction to alcohol, went to rehab. All of this happened while the band was about to start working on their 8th studio album. To make matters even worse, this super tumultuous period was recorded for the documentary Some Kind of Monster. This was definitely a rough period for the band. One of the members left, one of their primary songwriters was dealing with a lot of heavy stuff, and they're having some of their most vulnerable moments as a unit being recorded and broadcasted to the entire world. I won't be talking about some kind of monster in this retrospective because I just want to focus on the music, but it might be interesting to look at in the future. Basically, all we need to know is that Jason left, James comes back from rehab and was sober, and the band found a new bassist in Robert Trujillo, formerly of Suicidal Tendencies and Ozzy Osbourne. Now on to the album. <laughs> Three major interesting choices were made with the album, so before we get to listening to the songs, I think I should let you know about them if you don't know what they are. First off, the guitars were tuned down. Not down to like E flat or D standard, which the band has done sparingly before, but going all the way down to drop C. Those who don't play guitar or listen to heavier music, essentially the band made their guitars go down to lower notes to get heavier sounds out of them. I'm not sure who made this choice. Second off, there's no solos on this album. This choice was made by Lars. These first two choices were made to keep Metallica sounding modern. The late 90s and early 2000s saw the rise of alternative metal styles come to prominence, specifically new metal. Think bands like System of a Down, Korn, and I'm sorry that I'm mentioning them, but Limp Bizkit. Low tunings were a staple of the genre and solos didn't really play an integral part in the songs. So to keep with the times, for the first time the band was chasing a sound rather than inventing a new one. The final choice was made by Lars and it involves his snare drum. The snares that give a snare drum its distinct, almost rattling tone were disengaged for the whole album. I'm not going to comment on whether or not any of these choices were good or bad just yet, I just wanted to bring attention to them before we got into the album. With all that said, let's listen to the first track off of Saint Anger. Frantic starts off really fast and aggressive. The production sounds super muddy. The guitars don't sound nearly as sharp as they did before and the drums kinda sound bad. Looking past the messy production, the main melody of this song is okay. It has this groove to it that I kinda like. The lyrics on this song talk about addiction. Fran tick 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 tock isn't necessarily lyrical genius. James also does this odd thing with his voice that sees him opening his throat all the way and it sounds pretty weird to me. Like he's forcing his voice out of its range. He does that a couple times on the song, actually. This track feels like it drags on a little bit through its almost 6 minute runtime. Not having any solos on this album is difficult when all the songs are at minimum 5 minutes and 30 seconds and can go up to almost 9 minutes. Without solos, the band is essentially taking away a piece that they can use to pace out their songs. If the pacing were a little better, we'd have a really solid song on our hands. As it stands, I'm pretty lukewarm on this track. The intro riff on St. Anger is pretty solid. In fact, the entire intro is really good. It's a minute long, but it does well to build on itself. The verse is split into two different halves, a clean section and a distorted section. We move into the chorus and it's pretty solid. One thing I like in this chorus is the callback to Damage Incorporated with the lyric fuck it all and no regrets, I hit the lights on these dark sets. I feel like it was appropriately repurposed for this song. The band has done this on a couple tracks before, specifically King Nothing and Unforgiven 2, but there they just felt like hollow references. But on this occasion the lyrics are given new context. I think what James means here is that he doesn't have any fear about exposing himself and being vulnerable. Not exposing himself, but exposing who he is. On the flip side, the lyric I'm madly in anger with you isn't that strong. They can't all be winners. The song bounces from the same verse to the chorus a couple times before we're taken into the bridge, which is okay overall. The song isn't too bad, but like the last song, it can use some editing. Some Kind of Monster starts off with a blues-inspired riff that isn't too bad. What's really monstrous about this song is the lyrics. It sticks to the super repetitive these are the blank that blank format which wouldn't be too bad if it was clever but it isn't. The pre-chorus we the people are we the people feels like it comes out of nowhere. It seems vaguely political but nothing else in the song gives me that same idea. The track is pretty tiring too. It's 8 minutes long and it doesn't really have anything to justify its length. 
There's a change up about six minutes in, but it just feels like padding. The ominous I am in us line is also really, really weak. This track is super bloated and doesn't really bring in too many interesting ideas. Again, if this song was shorter, there could be something here. The instrumentation on Dirty Window has a lot of forward momentum and the vocals come in with a lot of energy. I think the weakest part about this song has to be the protector projector lines. If those could have been reworked, then the song would have been great. Other than that one gripe, I think this track is pretty solid. It doesn't overstay its welcome and keeps the pace of the album moving along. The riff introducing Invisible Kid is really strong. I love the way everything comes in and just layers on top of each other. Lyrically, James is coming to terms with the fact that he was a child that was mainly seen but never heard. He was keeping to himself in fear of getting hurt. I've heard complaints that people didn't really like this album and one of the main reasons they didn't like it was because of James's really vulnerable lyrics. Don't get me wrong, these lyrics aren't stellar, but they sound genuine. I'll take a thousand invisible kids before I take one ain't my bitch or two by four. There's a halftime break at around five minutes into the song and it's here where Lars' choice about his drums rears its ugly head the worst. I was able to keep it in the background for most of this album so far, but because the drum part is so exposed here, it sounds like someone is banging a pot right into my ears. It was a confusing choice to make and I will never understand why he did it. Again, the song is okay. It just needs to be cut down by a verse, chorus, and bridge or two. My World is the weakest song on this album so far. It doesn't really bring anything interesting to the table. It tries to have some edge by throwing in a couple motherfuckers and one bitches, but it comes off super awkward. I think my favorite part about this song is when James sings, not only do I not know the answer, I don't even know what the question is. I've never related to a lyric so hard. Shout out to all the clueless people out there. This one's for you. Nothing else in the song really sticks out, so I don't think it needed to be on this album. I really like the intro of Shoot Me Again. It has this really hard hitting guitar and the energy it brings is super infectious. I like how it leads into the verse as well. During the verse there's a guitar playing an accompaniment with James's vocals and I think it works really well. I don't really think we needed a refrain and a pre-chorus that are pretty much the same thing though. The band should have really stuck with one or the other if they just had to include something right before the chorus. During the bridge we get the closest thing to a new metal rap we'd ever get out of Metallica. It's pretty funny. It makes me laugh whenever I hear it. I'm sick of saying this but but this track did not need to be 7 minutes long. It would have been fine if it was around 5 minutes, but all the different parts kind of bloated up. Sweet Amber is pretty solid. The riffs in the song are fun and sound great. Each part has its own identity and they flow seamlessly into each other. Also the bass is doing some pretty interesting stuff throughout the song. Fun fact, because Metallica didn't have a bassist while recording, Bob Rock filled in. This song is pretty decent and it feels like a standout on this album. The unnamed feeling is about mental health struggles. A lot of people think that this is one of the stronger tracks on this album and I think I agree. The instruments go from this anxious feel during the verses and it switches over to a calmer, clean feel during most of the chorus. This juxtaposition really serves the song well. The bass right before the bridge sounds big and fat and it's great. The song's 7 minute runtime doesn't exactly fly by but it doesn't drag either. Two songs back to back that are pretty good. Purify is one of the least liked tracks on this album and again I think I agree. The song doesn't really bring anything new. The riffs are weak, the lyrics are weak, Lars is just in the corner banging on his pans and doing his own thing. The track feels really disjointed. The song kinda drones on and on for 5 minutes and it isn't that substantial. Easily could have been cut from the album and nothing would have been lost. All Within My Hands starts off really aggressive before going into a much calmer verse that leads us into a bombastic chorus. I actually really like this song. It's all about having something that you want to hold close to you but you're actually holding on to tight. Remember of Mice and Men? The book, not the band. Remember how Lenny would accidentally kill the rabbits he was holding because he would handle them too roughly? That's pretty much the song's thesis. The riffs and the different parts of the song all fit together really well. Performances on this track are pretty top notch, especially from James. If I could change one thing about this track, it'd definitely have to be the kill 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 outro. It's just so unnecessary and pretty cringy if you ask me. Other than that, I could definitely see myself listening to the song again.
I'm gonna say something really controversial. I don't think Saint Anger is as bad as everyone makes it out to be. I know, I know, but let me explain. I don't really mind the production of the album. I like that it sounds super sludgy and messy. This album isn't meant to be pristine and perfect. The LP is super ugly production-wise and lyrically. This might have not been the most perfect album and there are certainly some confusing choices, but it's the kind of ugly I can appreciate. Kind of like a pug. The main problem with this album is that the songs go on for way too long sometimes. I did find that somebody pulled a Topher Grace and actually edited down this album so it's under an hour and I think it's great. I'm gonna give this album a C-. minus. I enjoy it, I'll probably listen to it again in the future, but it definitely won't be my first pick. Despite its super divisive reputation, Saint Anger went on to hit the top of the charts in 30 different countries. The band actually did not wait too long to start working on their ninth studio album following Saint Anger. In 2006, Metallica started writing music for their new project and started recording in March of 2007. The album would not be released until September 2008, and this was roughly when I was introduced to the band. It's crazy to think that this album came out 15 years ago. Time really does fly. Before we get into this album, I just want to preface it by saying that I may or may not have a little bias in favor of this album. It's hard not to shake off those biases for an album that introduced you to a new artist. I'm going down memory lane just by looking at this track list. Hopefully this album still holds up. I haven't listened to this thing since college and I'm excited to re-experience it. This is your life! If Load, Reload, and Saint Anger was Metallica experimenting with new sounds, then Death Magnetic was a return to form. The riffs go back up to their breakneck tempos and Metallica feels like they're hopping right back on the saddle. This album pulls a lot of inspiration from the band's work in the late 80s. It sounds like Metallica is trying to recapture the energy they had on previous albums. With that brief overview out of the way, let's dive into Death Magnetic. <laughs> That Was Just Your Life starts off super eerie. The opening lick sounds really ominous and the bass adding its own part is great. We do, however, run into some sound issues as soon as the distorted guitars and drums come in. Everything sounds overly compressed at this volume. Ever since the new millennium hit, it's like Metallica forgot how to make something sound clean and sharp. Specifically, the drums sound really blown out, but let's move past that. The song's main riff goes hard as hell. James's singing sounds great here. It's not the shouty, barky voice I loved from the first four albums, but it sounds like he has a lot of control while singing. The chorus riff almost feels punk in nature. It's just straight chords driving the song along. The instrumental break after the second chorus brings back something that was sorely missed on the last album. Harmonizing guitar lines and a fantastic solo from Kirk. You could tell the band missed doing this kind of thing because there's another instrumental break with harmonized guitar parts after the bridge. Honestly, all these unique parts flow together really well. This was a fantastic way to start the album. I kind of wish the end of the line started about 30 seconds later because the intro to the song feels a little like filler. But the riffs on the verse, pre-chorus, and chorus all hit really hard. The chorus sees the two guitar players splitting off to play their own lines and it's pretty fun. Before the bridge we get another instrumental break that leads us into a solo. And here's where I'm going to talk about Kirk's crutch. It's been around for almost 30 years at this point, so I might as well mention it now. Kirk relies too much on his wah pedal. Don't get me wrong, I love different effects and I love a good wah, but sometimes Kirk throws it in a little too much. And that's all I'm gonna say about it, it's just a bit much at times. The bridge is a very quiet section that helps pace out the energy of the song. The final pre-chorus and chorus bring back the energy. The last chorus feels like a huge climactic point of the song and it's honestly just great. Broken Beat and Scarred suffers from the same problem all the songs on this album have suffered from so far, rough production. But here it sounds particularly rough. I think Lars was on a mission to make his drums sound bad in different ways in the 2000s. The opening riff is pretty good though. The intro overall is strong. I love the riff in the song's verses. It's just fun to listen to. Lyrically, the song is at the same level as every other song on this album so far. Average. Nothing great, nothing offensive. I could live with middling lyricism if I'm being honest. The solo goes hard as fuck. You could tell Kirk had something to prove on this album because he didn't get to do anything creatively on the last album. And he comes out swinging. These first three solos are really strong. The problem I have with this specific solo is that I wish it was a little louder. It kind of gets lost in the mix. 
This track was okay. Not really a standout, but not really too bad. The Day That Never Comes is a ballad reminiscent of Fade to Black. They both start off with clean guitars, an overdriven lead part, and bass and drums playing in unison. But you could bite your own tracks, it's fine. I don't have an issue with it. Aside from the lyrics, I think the song is good. Speaking of the lyrics, look at this genius annotation. All of this is a mess. Anyway, after the bridge, the song picks up really quickly, and it's genuinely good. It kind of reminds me of Sanitarium in a way. Both songs start off super slow, then really pick up in the back half. I like it. Can't really say much more than that. Fun fact, the intro of this song is one of the first things I learned how to play after I learned what drop tuning was. Anyway, this song is full of energy. It's super infectious. Apparently this song is supposed to be about the hounds of Tin Tindalos? I'm gonna go with Tindalos. Another creature from the Lovecraft mythos. So far this album feels like Metallica is trying to recapture who they were back in the 80s and I'm absolutely here for it. Everything about this song just screams that it's trying to recapture the energy they had in the latter half of the decade. The Lovecraftian lyrics, the insane speed, the multiple solos, Lars just going absolutely ballistic on his double kick drum. It's all there. The song is a standout on the album for me. You know, I've been listening to Cyanide for a couple minutes now and I can't really think of anything to say about it. It's a song, yeah. It's fine. It's not bad, but it feels like filler to me. Nothing really interesting happens throughout this song's six and a half minute runtime. It kind of just does its own thing for a bit. Probably not a song I'd revisit soon. The Unforgiven 3, The Unforgivenist, begins with a piano and some strings to really throw us off from the vibe of the last track. As you might guess, this song draws heavily from the first Unforgiven track, structure-wise. Big, loud verses, clean, calm choruses. The song is pretty serviceable. This kind of feels like the low point in the album for me. Don't get me wrong, it's better than The Unforgiven 2, but nowhere near as good as The Unforgiven. I really like the riffs on the Judas Kiss, especially the riff after the chorus. It's got this stank on it that I can't help but enjoy. Also, I always picture James doing this dance whenever I hear it. The instrumental break in this song is great. I love how everyone plays the same line with Kirk as he's playing his solo. Really just a great moment. And the ending of Kirk's first solo sounds just fantastic. Great song all around. Suicide and Redemption is the first instrumental track on a Metallica album in 20 years. I love the bass line introducing us to the song. That line is fantastic, I don't know what to tell you. However, we hit the song's high point really early with that bass line. This is definitely the album's lowest point. There really isn't anything creative about this track. Everything seems pretty by the numbers. And it's the longest Metallica track if you don't count the extended version of the Outlaw Torn or the Merciful Fate medley they did on Garage Inc. This is easily my least favorite instrumental the band has put out. There's nothing really fantastic about it other than the bass in the intro, and that alone isn't enough to carry this song. The fact that it's 10 minutes long is super rough. The song did not need to be this long. It does a lot of repeating of old ideas that just don't warrant it. At least Lars gets a solo on this song. My Apocalypse has to be one of the best songs on this album. This is not the first time anyone is saying this. The riffs on the song go hard, everyone is performing at their peak, and it just feels great. It kind of reminds me of Damage Inc. or Dyer's Eve. The band knew they had to end those respective albums on a high, and this was Death Magnetic's version of doing that. The song is fantastic. It proves the band can still perform like they did in their 20s even when they're pushing 50. This album is pretty decent. It was nice to re-listen to the LP that first got me into Metallica, and it was a pleasant trip down memory lane. I think what really holds this album back is its production. It doesn't sound great at all. That and a couple tracks just felt really weak, namely Suicide and Redemption and Cyanide. Overall, I'd give this album a C. To say that Death Magnetic pulled the masses back to Metallica would be an understatement. It was the band's fifth album in a row to debut at number one on the Billboard 200, making them the first band to ever do so. The album also sold almost half a million copies in the US in its first three days. On top of that, Death Magnetic also peaked at number one in 34 different countries. To say this album was successful is underselling it a bit. Again, Metallica has reached another peak in their journey. But it wouldn't be a while until their next album, and that's for a couple of different reasons. The tour they went on to support Death Magnetic would last over two years, mainly because of their two weeks on, two weeks off schedule at the time. In 2011, Rob said that the band had begun writing new material for their upcoming project. The next album, 
Hardwired to Self-Destruct, would not be released until November 2016. This eight-year gap is the longest period of time the band has gone without releasing a new album. Of course, there was a Death Magnetic bonus track EP, Beyond Magnetic, and the infamous Lulu released with Lou Reed, but there hasn't been a full-length Metallica album in eight years. It's during this period that I kind of fell out of my Metallica phase. I remember listening to Hardwired a couple of times at the time of release, but it just wasn't something I was looking for at that point in my life. I think I listened to it once in the last year out of curiosity, but I can't really tell you anything about it. But let's listen to this album with fresh ears and see how it is. Hardwired to Self-Destruct is Metallica's 10th studio album and it carries the same ideas that were present on Death Magnetic. Hardwired feels like a natural extension of Death Magnetic. It goes back to the band's thrash roots again while modernizing it at the same time. Metallica wasn't necessarily chasing any trends on this album, but they were more updating their sound a bit. Let's listen to the album, starting at the top with Hardwired. Off the bat, Hardwired hits you in the face. It sounds much better than the band's last two outings production-wise. This track is just raw energy. Its purpose isn't going for distance, but rather for speed. Also, the lyric, we're so fucked, shit out of luck, isn't peak writing, but it really fits the song well. This is a great way to start the album. It primes the listener for what's to come. I really enjoy this song. Side note, like the album art, the singles have edits of the band members' faces and I'll highlight them when they come up. This one's really good and just makes me laugh. My favorite part is the mini face without a nose. It's just hilarious to me. Atlas Rise is another single, so here's Kirk looking like he just experienced his Joker moment after being told that wah pedals have fallen out of style. Also, whoever designed this art accidentally made it look like this song is called Matless Rise. There's a lot of creativity behind the riffs that introduce the track. During the verses and the pre-chorus, the riff sort of feels like they're punctuating the lines that James is singing and it really works well. I love the chorus riff. It sounds incredible when the guitars are harmonizing with each other. The track flows really well. The solo here is nothing spectacular, but the break that comes after it is pretty fun. Every part of the song is strong and they all make sense together. Now That We're Dead is another single, so here we have Rob looking like the Incredible Bulk. The intro to the song isn't anything all too special. It just serves its purpose to set up the song as this medio tempo feeling groove. The verse is kinda weak, but the pre-chorus and chorus sound more like hard rock rather than the thrash metal we've been expecting on this album. And here is where I realized that if Load and Reload sounded like this, I probably would've liked them a lot more. Those two albums and Sane Anger to some degree felt like the band was going after a popular sound rather than carving out their own place within that sound. If it were produced a little differently, I could definitely picture this song on an album with Fuel or The Memory Remains, and that's not a bad thing. It definitely has the same vibe as those two songs. This track is pretty strong, but not a standout for me. Moth Into Flame was another single, so here's Lars doing a mix of the imposter Susface and Brendan Fraser. The track starts off really strong with harmonizing guitars that move into a chugging triplet riff. The song is, again, all about energy. Every piece of the track does its part to keep the song moving along at a brisk pace. I love the line that Kirk plays after the pre-chorus. It adds a ton of character to the song. One of the guitars playing in unison with James as he sings a moth into the flame is a nice little touch that I appreciate. Kirk's solo on this track starts off a little underwhelming but really picks up in the back half. The song really brings up the energy in the last verse. Lars is playing as fast as his little tennis legs can while hitting that double kick drum pattern. Another really strong song. Dream No More is another song about Cthulhu, and the intro does well to set up an eerie mood to the song. We get some layered vocals throughout this track and it works well. It lends itself to the madness and horror that is inspired by the subject matter. James is doing a great job performing this song. It doesn't sound like he's singing, more that he's performing the song. There's always a little theatrics when it comes to singing a song, and here is the most theatrical he's been since maybe the load reload days. But here it works so much better because he's not going completely overboard with it. Again, this is another strong song. Is it my favorite Cthulhu Metallica song? No, that's still called Cthulhu, but this song is still really good. Halo on Fire is next. 
It starts off with these loud punchy guitars and dials it back when going into the verse. It builds itself back up leading into the chorus and honestly I'm glad that this juxtaposition occurs. The songs have been really good so far but I was wanting a little more range because this album has just been hard, fast, and loud. This track does well to give us some variety that the album needed at this point. After the second chorus the tempo picks up a little bit and brings us to the song's first bridge. The song's speed is still slower than most of the stuff that came before it so this whole song feels like a rest point for the listener. The breakdown after the second bridge is great. A clean interlude throws off the scent of what's to come. I kind of wish this clean section lasted a little bit longer. Despite the song being a little over 8 minutes long, it doesn't need any editing. If anything, I want certain parts of the song to last a little longer. This song ends disc 1. Yeah, this album is on multiple discs. It's like we're playing Final Fantasy 7 on PlayStation and I'm here for it. Confusion starts off with a march. The guitar line playing over top of the march is super catchy to me. I feel like it'll be stuck in my head for a while. We transition smoothly into another riff that just goes hard. I think the weakest part of the song has to be the verses and choruses. Everything else, the instrumentation, the mini solo Kirk does in the second verse, the bridge are all great. The song changes up after the instrumental break and I think it is a much better part of the song. This track is okay. I probably won't willingly revisit it anytime soon, but it wasn't too bad. First things first, Man Unkind is a very corny title. Second off, the intro to the song is fantastic. Not at all what I was expecting from this track, let alone this album. Apparently that part was written by Rob. Let him do more shit, that was great. When the distortion comes in, it sounds okay. The verses and choruses don't feel like anything special. We go into an instrumental break after the second chorus and the whole song shifts along with it to a more hard-hitting feel. I'm not really a huge fan of it. We get some crazy sounds out of Kirk's guitar during his solo, but other than that and the quiet intro, nothing about the song really pulls me to it. This is probably the first song on this album that I would actively skip after the intro. Here Comes Revenge begins with wailing guitars and kind of a throwback feel in the guitar riff. The bass during the verse just sounds insane. I love how grimy it is. Overall, the verse sounds great. However, when we get to the chorus, it sounds a little stock to me. There's nothing spectacular about this song. It feels like what a Metallica song would sound like in the year 2016. It doesn't really stand out at all. It kind of drags on a little bit during its 7 minute runtime. M.I. Savage starts off really understated. It has a bluesy feel that carries through even when the distortion kicks in. This is another track about turning into a werewolf. If I had a dollar every time Metallica made a song about being a werewolf, I'd only have two dollars, but it's weird that it happened twice. I don't know, I'm not really feeling this song either. Most of the second half of this album feels like a couple of good ideas that try to carry an entire song. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. This is one of the times where it doesn't. The breakdown with the harmonics is one of the good ideas, but that alone doesn't carry the whole song. Murder One serves as a tribute to the late Motorhead frontman Lemmy. Motorhead was a huge inspiration for Metallica seeing as how they had an entire section of Garage Inc. dedicated to the band. This song is really good. The riffs go hard, James is singing as hard as he can, and it has a great vibe to it. The lyrics pay homage to Lenny and Motorhead. You can tell the song was created out of love and passion for their music. Spit Out the Bone straight up just punches you in the face when it starts. It holds nothing back, much like other closers on Metallica's thrashiest albums. I almost forgot to mention this is another single, so here's James screaming through his hands. This single art isn't my favorite of the five. The riff on this song goes undeniably hard. It's definitely one of the band's least restrained songs. This track doesn't have any breaks in it. Once it starts, it does not stop. You're going to get on this ride and you're not getting off until it's done. And holy shit, there's a bass interlude on this thing. It's not that long, but I got chills when I heard it. This song is great. Easily one of the best songs on this album. I have a lot of thoughts about this album, so let me just get them out here. Let's start with the negatives. First off, like many Metallica projects, it feels way too long. Like I said before, there's a few good ideas in the second half of the tracklist, but often there aren't enough to carry an entire song. 
Second, lyrically, this album isn't anything special. Remember when I was covering Kill 'Em All, which feels like forever ago, I said that the lyrics can be switched out for most of the songs and it wouldn't feel any different? I kind of feel the same way with this album. Now on to the positives. The production is far better than anything Metallica has put out up until then in the new century. Everything sounds fantastic. The first half of the tracklist is undeniably great. Spit Out the Bone is probably one of the best songs they've made in a couple of albums. When this album is good, it's great. I really enjoyed it. I'm feeling a decent B on this album. I can comfortably say that this is the best album Metallica has put out since the Black Album. The Metallica train kept rolling as evident by Hardwired's album sales. It sold almost 300,000 copies in its first week, debuted at number one, and was the third largest debut in 2016, only being edged out by massive pop stars Beyonce and Drake. The album would go on to hit the top 5 in 105, the top 3 in 75, and number 1 in 57 different countries. Another stunning success in Metallica's repertoire. But again, there was another long break without a new project after this album. Hardwired's follow-up, Metallica's 11th studio LP and most recent project, would not be released until April 2023, a whole 7 years after their 10th album. This was due to a couple of reasons. One being that in September 2019, James once again was admitted into rehab. The timeline is a little fuzzy, but his first public appearance was in January of 2020. Okay, sweet. James is back. The band has been working on stuff since the beginning of 2019 according to Robin Kirk, and now it's time to get back into the studio. Nothing would stop this album from coming out. The urgent message to stay home appears to finally be getting through. In California, the notoriously busy highways are nearly empty. The hustle and bustle of New York is at a standstill. This is obvious, but in case some kid in the year 2050 is watching this and hasn't gotten that far in their history textbook, in March 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic essentially shut down the entire world. This obviously meant that no one could work, people could not interact with each other, and most importantly, Metallica was not able to record their new album. During this period, the band took the time to record and cultivate ideas in their own home studios. They would communicate with each other on a weekly basis to see where they were all at. Okay, so let's move past lockdown but not the pandemic because it's still technically going on and head into 2023. Finally, 72 Seasons, Metallica's 11th studio album was released. Much like how Hardwired was a natural extension of Death Magnetic, 72 Seasons is a natural follow-up to Hardwired. Metallica continues to pull from their thrash roots on this album. The LP has received mostly positive reviews, debuted at number 2 on the Billboard 200, and hit number 1 in 20 countries. This is nothing new for the band, they've been here before and they've done it all. But how does 72 Seasons stack up? Let's find out. Seventy-two season starts off with a driving bass line and a hi-hat roll. When the song gets started, it knows that it has to make a great first impression. Energy's high and everyone feels like they're confident in what they're playing. It has the same feel as a lot of songs on Hardwired, so if you like that album, you'll probably like this song. There's one big difference. James's voice. It honestly sounds incredible on this track. In fact, everything sounds incredible. All the instruments everyone's playing, it all sounds really tight and really good. The change up in the pre-chorus serves as a little respite from the constant open E pedal notes and it's pretty solid too. After the second chorus, we get a bit of a key change and it is so welcome. The song is almost 8 minutes long, so having these little changes throughout do well to pace out the track. Kirk's solo here is kind of underwhelming though. It's such a shame because I heard some of the stuff on the solo record and there's some genuinely creative stuff on there. Maybe he's relying too much on metal conventions and his wah pedal so he might feel a little boxed in by it. Let me not psychoanalyze this guy I've never met off of one solo. But this track is great. I'm definitely going to add it to some playlists. Shadows Follow starts off with a really heavy, precise riff. It gives way to a groovier feel as the song's intro progresses. The riff on the verse isn't anything too crazy, but a highlight of the song has to be the transition that happens between the verse and the chorus. It has such a nice feel to it. The chorus builds up to its final lines, but it kinda just peters out. Like it was building up to something and it didn't know what it was building up to. After the second chorus, there's a small change up before we go back to the song's main hook. The solo, again, is nothing special. The song is okay. It keeps the energy going through the album and has some parts that sound and feel great. 
Screaming Suicide starts with Kirk wailing with his wah pedal, and I actually don't mind it here. I love the little flourishes that Lars does on his kick drums in the song's main hook. The verse riff feels like something off of a Black album. I can definitely picture something sounding like this being on that album. The song feels really tight. We move from verse to chorus to interludes pretty quickly. This album doesn't want to waste any time on its tracks, and I can really appreciate that. Kirk has some good moments during his solos, so welcome back, bud. We missed you. The song is pretty fun. I enjoyed it. Grimy bass intro? Sleepwalk My Life Away just sleepwalked right into my heart. Musically, this track doesn't bring too much to the table outside of the intro, but lyrically we get James exploring mental health and judging by the words in the song, I think he's specifically looking at addiction and depression. It's interesting because a lot of St. Anger was James coming to terms with his addiction, his emotions, and his depression, but here the lyrics feel different. They're definitely better written. For example, we don't have James screaming kill 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 over and over again, which is nice. This is probably the lyrical high point on the album so far. I'm gonna be honest. I was not a fan of You Must Burn when I first heard it. It has this medio tempo groove that feels just slightly awkward to me. The riff feels pretty disjointed too. There's a super interesting moment at the end of the chorus when James sings You Must Burn that sounds really cool. I don't know much about music theory because I'm not a fucking nerd, but something about how he lands on the note for burn sounds really great to me. In fact, James's performance on the song is really interesting. He's kinda got this distortion in his voice especially during the choruses. It's not like he's pushing himself too hard on the song, but it gives the voice vocals some bite that sounds really good. I'm not the biggest fan of the song, but there is some stuff to be appreciated about it. Oh fuck yeah, I love this song. Lux Eterna comes out of the gate with tons of energy. This track is just pure fun. It kind of reminds me of songs like Seek and Destroy or Hit the Lights. These three songs just have a fun vibe to them and I dig it. Lux Eterna is non-stop speed. It comes in, does its thing, and leaves you wanting more. It kind of makes me wish that more Metallica tracks were less than 4 minutes long because it shows how tight the band can be. I really like this track. Definitely one of the standouts on this album for me. Crown of Barbed Wire feels different from anything we've heard so far on the album. This is the slowest song on the album so far, and it really enjoys its groove. But do I enjoy it? Eh. It feels a little boring. The ideas that it brings aren't too interesting. Nothing about this song is really pulling me. I'm not a fan of this song. Chasing Light brings weight rather than speed. The song is pretty heavy when comparing it to Metallica's recent catalog. The production on the pre-chorus is fantastic. The chorus is fantastic too. James screaming Lean On Me is definitely one of the highlights of this album. It's the closest we're gonna get to Master of Puppets vocals and I'm totally okay with that. The bridge on this track is pretty groovy. So is the instrumental break afterwards. I really enjoy this song. I love the march during the intro of If Darkness Had a Sun. The whole vibe of the riff just feels really cool. The song's main hook is great too. The chorus, however, is a little weak. Honestly, James's vocals on the chorus save it for me. I love the riff that plays under the solo. It's just so funky. The song is really well put together. Every part of the track works in its own way and it sounds fantastic. <laughs> I like Too Far Gone's main hook as well as the riff in the verse. The chorus riff goes hard as hell too. Honestly, I haven't been writing much about this song because I've been too busy enjoying it. The instrumental break with the harmonizing guitars just sounds incredible. The layered vocals during the bridge honestly gave me chills. The song is fantastic. Definitely another standout for me. Room of Mirrors is another song that just goes hard. Everyone's dialed in on this cut and you can feel how much fun everyone is having playing the song. All the little parts in the song fit together like puzzle pieces. We're expertly taken from one section to another. We also get a shout out to Broken Beat and Scarred in the lyrics on the song and I really appreciate that. It was one of my favorites from Death Magnetic. The instrumental break after the solo is just fantastic. Again, another highlight on this album. In Amarada has the honor of being Metallica's longest original song, and it has a lot of goodwill from fans. The track starts off really strong. I caught myself bobbing my head along to the song, something I've done with a lot of tracks on this LP so far. The pre-chorus goes into this halftime feel, and it's great. The stripped down section in the middle of the song sounds really good too. That's what the album was missing. I don't mean this as a pejorative, but 72 Seasons has been all hard and loud for most of its 77 minute long runtime. This brief moment to bring everything down feels like it makes a lot of sense here. This is a super long song, so it definitely needs a rest stop. Despite the fact that I think the song is a little too long, I like it a lot. I get why everyone was talking it up so much now.
I really, really like this album. I know that I said Hardwired was the best album the band has put out since their self-titled, but I think this album is better than their previous outing. Honestly, I think it's on the same level as the Black album. I feel completely comfortable giving this album an A-. Everything about it just feels so right. There's only one song that didn't really do it for me, but on a Metallica album in the year 2023, that's a really big deal. I really enjoyed this album. With all that being said and done, I just want to say thank you for watching, I really do appreciate it. If you were watching these videos as they came out, then I really want to thank you for all the support that you've been providing over the past month. I genuinely wouldn't have gotten through this retrospective without all the motivation you guys have been giving me through comments, through subbing, through sharing, all of that is very much appreciated. If you're watching this big however long version of the full retrospective, then I want to say thank you to you too. You made it through the video. We made it through the video. There's going to be more retrospectives in the future. I know a lot of people have been asking me to do a Megadeth retrospective, but I think I'm going to do a couple of different projects in between that and this. So if you're not already subscribed, go ahead and hit that button below to be notified when those videos are going to go up. I can't say it enough, but again, thank you all so much for watching and supporting this channel over the past month, and I'll see you next time.